You know, before we begin and resume our survey of numbers, that song kind of reminded me of a scripture about God's unfailing love. So if you would give me just a moment and then we'll review our survey of numbers. But let's talk a little bit just as way of encouragement to those in here that may have messed up or failed lately. Never question God's love for you. Go to Luke 15, if you will. So I start this morning as a way of encouragement to us sinners in the room. Luke 15, God's love never fail, even though we may fail. Luke 15, starting at verse 11, is the famous prodigal son um, passage. We always need this reminder that God's love for us never fails, even though we fail. And I want to just share something with you guys uh, from my personal life. I shared this with somebody. So a couple of days ago, um, I went to sleep with something heavy on my mind, uh, and it was a failure, uh, mo mostly a mental failure. And as I was uh, asleep, I had a dream that I was falling from the sky. <laughs> and a, a bright light just covered me, um, uh, covered me. And, and all of a sudden, as I was contemplating my failure, I heard a hymn just begin to come out of nowhere. And it was about the grace of God. And God was teaching me to not concentrate on my failure because my grace is sufficient for all of your failures. And we should always remind ourselves when we fail that God's grace is sufficient. Where sin abound, God's grace abound even the more. There is always grace for our failure because of the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's begin at verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. Now I will go ahead and interpret this. The two sons is a picture of two believers. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Loose living is a picture of sinful living. So what we see here, God the Father is a certain man. The two sons is two believers in Jesus Christ. One of the believers decided to get out of fellowship with God and go down the my way highway, um, a way that is a sinful way. And in verse 14, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country and he began to be in province. So this young man who uh, got out of fellowship or left home for a sinful lifestyle, uh, began to be improvised. The improvised is a picture of divine discipline. As you all know already, that when God disciplined his children, that discipline falls in three categories, warning discipline, intensive discipline, and dying discipline. Well, this believer is going to experience warning discipline in verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed swine. This is a picture of a hall pen Christian. A hall pen Christian is a Christian who choose to forsake his fellowship with God uh, for the world and for a sinful lifestyle. And so he decided to uh, 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 fellowship with the pigs. Verse 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. This is a picture of a believer out of fellowship. Uh, it's flawed now because of he's out of fellowship with God. He no longer have moral standards. But when he had came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men 
have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. So he began to take inventory of his life. And he realized that uh, uh, what his life had become because he left away, uh, ran away from uh, left home. Uh, uh, before he left home, he was living in the palace, but now it is as if he is living in the dungeon. Verse 18, I would get up and go to my father and I would say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So actually this prodigal thought that he had lost his status in the family relationship. And he felt as though in order to amend that relationship, um, he need to one, confess his sin, and two, he had to perform to win his father's love back. But if you look at verse 20, so he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw, saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. For the father said to the slave, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. So what we see here is a believer in Jesus Christ chooses to get out of fellowship with God for a lifestyle of sin and rebellion. And as he living in rebellion and sin and perpetual carnality, uh, his life began to fall apart, which is a picture of the divine discipline. He take inventory of his life in that condition. He realized that I need to go back home. I need to go back to the palace. And the palace is really just, I need to go back to living the spiritual life. And so he thought that in order to uh, uh, come back into a family relationship, he had to earn his way back into the relationship. But when he was on his way back, the father was already so excited and glad to see him and began to embrace him and kiss him, which showed him that the father had never stopped loving him. He had never lost his relationship with God. He have just lost that intimate, close fellowship and the blessing that comes with intimately walking close with the Father. And see, as a believer, we all mess up, we fail, but we don't lose our relationship with God, but we lose our fellowship and the intimacy of that fellowship and therefore the blessing that comes with that intimate walk with God through our obedience. And I wanted to bring this out, you know, just thinking about that, that psalm, because sometimes we can not only be overwhelmed with guilt, but we also can think that we have to earn God's love back. We don't have to earn God's love. All we have to do, and all this young man did, was acknowledge his sin. And that's all we do when we fail and mess up. Now, that is not a license to continue to live in sin. But that is the only way we can serve God. We must always, by faith, claim God's love when we mess up and not be weighed down with guilt. Now, when we confess our sin, we are to uh, 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 accept God's forgiveness. And we're not to continue to remind ourselves of the wrong that we've done. Because guilt, it just us getting back out of fellowship. We're failing the truth that God has forgiven us. And so just our encouragement to... Uh, if you guys fail like me uh, at times, probably not in what you do, but probably in some you say or some you think, uh, all you have to do is acknowledge that failure because God's grace is sufficient. Where sin abound, grace abound the more. Praise the Lord. <laughs> all right, let's go to the book of Numbers. So we're resuming our study. Uh, we're doing a survey of the book of Numbers. We're doing a survey of the book of Numbers, and we're looking at the faith failure of the Exodus generation. The Exodus generation failed to trust God, and that hindered their progression to the promised land. That hindered their progression to the promised land. See, when we fail to trust God and take God at his word, it hindered our progression 
and experiencing the peace of God and the blessing that God has in store for us. Now, for you guys who uh, wasn't here uh, last week or the week before when we did this introduction to the book of Numbers, uh, there are three sections in the book of Numbers or three divisions. We saw that in chapter one through 10, uh, the Exodus generation prepared to march to the promised land. And then in chapter 11 through 21, we see various testing of their faith and their failure to trust God and keep on marching to the promised land. So sin and disobedient and lack of faith hindered their progression to the promised land. And that what we see in chapter 11 through 21. And then in chapter 22 through 36, we see instruction to and preparation for a new generation who is about to enter into the promised land. Now we are now currently in the second section of uh, Numbers. And so let's start, let's go back to uh, chapter 11. We're not gonna spend a lot of time in chapter 11 because we already did. We're not gonna spend a lot of time in chapter 12 because we did. But what we learn in chapter 11 is that the progression to the promised land was hindered. It came to a stop. And also in chapter 12 with uh, uh, the disobedience of Miriam and Aaron, the progression to the promised land stopped. And now we go to chapter 13. And we also see a progression of the promised land stopping because the people is gonna fail to take the promised land. And see, doubt and unbelief is always a hindrance to progression in the spiritual life. And that is what we see in chapter 13, doubt and fear hindering progression, progression to the promised land, which is a picture of how doubt and fear in the Christian life hinder us from experiencing God's inner happiness and God's peace and also the blessing that comes with taking God at his word. Let's start at verse uh, one. Can I get someone to begin reading verse, uh, um, actually, we don't need to look at the, uh, somebody read verse one through 16. One through 16. Any volunteers? Don't be terrified of the names. They are not here, so they're not gonna fault you for butchering their names. <laughs> Hawkins, <laughs> start at verse one, chapter 13, verse one. Then the word spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourself men that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give you, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord. All of them, men who were heads of the sons of Israel. These men, the, these then were their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, and the son of Zachor. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, and the son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, and the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Miguel, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu, from the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, and the son of Zodai, from the tribe of Joseph, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi, from the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali, from the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, from the tribe of Nathali, Nabi, and the son of Ophsa, from the tribe of Gad, Guel, and the son of Nakai. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. But Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Amen. Now, I want you to go now to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Now, it was not God's original idea for the people to spy out the land. It was not God's idea for the people to go and spot the land. God allowed it in his permissive will, but it was not his will that they do that. Okay? But he allowed it. 
because look at Deuteronomy 1, 20, 1 and 22. See the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your father has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you approached me and said, let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring back to us word of the, by, of the way by which we should go up and the cities which we shall enter. So it sounds like in chapter 13 that God was the one that commanded them to go and spy out the land. No, the people had came up to Moses and, and asked him, instead of them just taking God at his word, uh, believe in his promise and just going up to take the land in full confidence that God has the power and the faithfulness to give them that land. They came up to Moses and said, you know, you need to send someone to spy the land. And God allowed it. But that was unbelief. And so I wanted to show you that it was not God's perfect will for them to go and um, spy out the land. Um, God is faithful, and he also have the power to do what he said he's going to do. Verse 17, can I get a volunteer? Verse 17 through 24 of Numbers 13. Thank you. When they returned from spying not the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him and said, we went in to the land where you sent us and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, anytime you see someone add but or nevertheless doubt and fear have creeped in. The people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And so their attention is shifting from the promise of God. God had already promised this land to them. So it don't matter who's in the land or what the circumstance looks like. We are to take God at his word. Verse 29, Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusite and the Amorites are living in the hill country and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we shall by all means go up and take possession of it for we surely can overcome it. So here you got a believer, um, Caleb, who took God at his word and he did not allow the, the, the circumstance to control his emotion. 
and cause him to fear and to worry. Here's a man who is taking God at his word. Uh, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are too strong for us. So this is choosing to not take God at his word and this will hinder their progression to the promised land. So they got up, gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land where they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone and spying out is a land that devoured inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. In other words, we cannot take the land. And that is totally uh, disobedience. And look how the people responded in verse uh, chapter 14, verse one. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in the wilderness? Why is this the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? See, if God wanted them to die, he could have just left them in Egypt. But he brought them out of Egypt because he had a plan. He had uh, a covenant and promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to fulfill. And nothing will taught the plan of God. And so here, God could have left them in Egypt. If he wanted to kill them, he brought them out because he had a plan for them. Verse four, so they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Now this is rebellion because God told them to go for, forward, but they wanna go backwards in fear and in worry. And so this is rebellion. So rebellion is gonna hinder their progression to the promised land. Verse five, then Moses and Aaron fell on their face in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation, the sons of Israel, saying, the land which we passed through to spy out is an exceeding good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Now, these men had a different spirit than most of the congregation. Their spirit was that of totally confidence in God's ability to give them the land to uh, fulfill his promises and his faithfulness. So they were concentrating on the character of God rather than concentrating on the circumstance. So here's the deal. Confidence in God gives us courage before men and circumstance. Confidence in God gives us courage before men and circumstance. In other words, we don't fear man, we don't fear circumstances because our confidence is in God. Our confidence is in his word. But whenever we don't know God's promises and know God's word, whenever we don't concentrate on who and what God is, then we will have fear before man, and we will have worry and anxiety as we approach circumstances. As believers in Jesus Christ, we should always be poised in the midst of every circumstance that we find ourselves in because our confidence is in the promises of God. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. The word of God did not say that the weapon would not be formed, but it would not prosper. Verse uh, 10, but all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. The Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me? How long will they not take me at my word? Despite all the sign, I have shown them all these miracles to strengthen their faith. I brought them out of Egypt. They saw my miracles and yet they still failed to take me at my word. They should have used my past miracles to motivate them, encourage them to trust me. And he say, uh, I will smite them with pestilence and dispose them, and I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. Now, let me ask you, ask you, ask you could God destroy all the people? Could God destroy all the people? Well, he can do it, but he can't do it in a sense. And why 
can it he do it? Why he cannot destroy all the people? Anybody know? Because of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he will find a way to discipline the rebellious ones and at the same time keep his plan in motion. And then in verse 13, but Moses interceded and said, Lord, then if you do that, then the Egyptian will hear of it. For by your strength, you brought up this people from their midst and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen eye to eye while your cloud stands over them and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you slay this people as one man, then the nation who heard of your fame would say, because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he promised, then by oath, therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now, you know God is not going to have that. <laughs> He's not going to have anyone saying that he did not have the ability and the power to do what he say he is going to do. And, uh, and then verse 17, but now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. See, God cannot compromise his character. He loved these people and he is faithful, but all of his attributes must work together at the same time. He cannot compromise his integrity. And he's so wise because he found a way to do what he said he's going to do without compromising his integrity. The righteousness of God rejects sin. The justice of God must judge sin. OK, so he can't compromise his righteousness and his justice. And so he got to find a way to actually do what he said he's going to do without compromising his character. All right. Next verse. Uh, verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, forgiving and meek and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the father on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness. Just as you also have forgiven this people from Egypt, even into now. Verse 20. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. But indeed, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men who have seen my glory, my sign, which I perform in Egypt, and in the wilderness yet have put me to the test these 10 times. Look at the patience of God, the patient and long suffering of God, giving these believers time to grow. You know what's gonna happen? They're gonna face the sin unto death. But he gave them time to grow and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their father, nor shall any of those who spurn me see it. Now, God is just because, think about it, and he also a God of love because he was patient and long-suffering. That's his love. And he gave them many opportunities to trust in him and obey him. But they didn't. But he also is a God who is just and righteous, so he has to deal with sin in the midst. And go to verse... Um, 24, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered and his descendants shall take possession over. So God said, Caleb. So you had two types of believers within the congregation. You had those who were uh, unbelieving and rebellious, and then you had those who took God at his word, and those who took God as his word, like Caleb and Joshua. Uh, who had a different spirit, a different spirit meaning that they're those who take God at his word, who trust in God, who have confidence before man and circumstance because their confidence is in the promises of God. Um, one of the basic things that a new believer should learn is the promises of God because those promises is going to help the new believer or even the believer have confidence before man and circumstances so that we can experience God's inner happiness. All right, let's go to Hebrews. I mean, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 
4. And then we'll take a 10 minute break. Philippians 4. In Philippians 4, verse 4. Philippians 4, verse 4. Actually, let's start at verse 1. Context. Let's look at verse 1 through 7. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Idur Adia and I urge Cynthia to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I would say rejoice. Now this phrase here, rejoice, is me, it could be translated, be happy all the time. Be happy all the time. So Paul is commanding these believers to be happy all the time. Is it possible for believers in Jesus Christ to be happy all the time? Yes, it is possible. He would not be commanding believer to be happy all the time if it is not possible. Because a believer's happiness should never depend on people and circumstances. Our happiness should always depend on God and his promises to us. Let your generous spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So instead of worrying, I am to petition God for whatever it is that may be bothering me. And look what happened in verse seven. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God here is a reference to uh, calmness of soul or uh, poise in the midst of all circumstance. So instead of worry and, 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 and being filled with anxiety, I am to, in prayer, in faith, take my request to God, put it in God's hand, and now I am to relax, take God at his word, and just wait now patient on him to do what he said he's going to do. And he has the power to do what he said he's going to do. And he also faithful to what he had promised. Let us pray. Father, we're just so grateful for your word. In your word, you have over 7,000 promises that you want us to learn and claim. And Father, it is through your promises that we have peace, we have joy in spite of our circumstances. I pray, Father, that you will press upon all of our heart the importance of getting to know you through studying your word and getting to know your promises, because it is through knowing you and your promise that we have confidence before man and circumstances. We ask that you will help us to meditate on what hindered these believers from going into the promised land in his unbelief. And we pray that you remove any unbelief from our midst and help us to be people of faith who are confident that you always do what you say you're going to do. Keep our minds and heart. In Christ's name, amen. We'll take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back for our second section in 10 minutes. <laughs>